Okay. So uh, today's speaker is Tomas Niklaus. He's kindly agreed uh, to do this. The title is Grotendieck-Witt Theory. Take it away, Tomas. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. And yeah, it's great to speak here. And like again, I let me also say I'd really like to to have questions and stuff like that. And so what I'm talking today about is Grotendieck-Witt Theory, and that's something I've been actually thinking about for years now. It's really one of my oldest projects and I've been thinking about it and there were always like parts of the story which I couldn't prove. But eventually, in a, I mean, a lot of people somehow had great ideas and we all, I mean, we all came together and I think now we're pretty happy about the story. So this is joined with uh, Baptiste Calmes, Emanuele Dotto, Jonathan Harpas, Fabian Hebestreit, Markus Land, Christian Moy, Dennis Nardin and Wolfgang Steimle in a bunch of different papers. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm, what is Grotendieck Witt theory? So the setting is the following: I let R be a commutative ring. I mean, everything can be done slightly more generally, but let me stick to that generality. And what we want to do is we want to study unimodular symmetric forms over R. Forms over R. What does that mean? That means, well, I mean, I have a bilinear form, P tensor Q, with, from P tensor over R, P to R, where R is a, P is a project, finite projective, finite projective R module. And Q is symmetric. That's what a symmetric bilinear form would be. And then it's unimodular, that means, uh, the adjunct of that map, so the induced map from P into the dual of P, which is just hom, R linear homs from P to R, that adjunct, adjunct map is an isomorphism. So it's like non-degenerate. And that's, I mean, of course, been studied a lot algebraically. And one way to study those is uh, by looking at what is called the Grotendieck-Witt group. And that is defined as follows. Definition. The Grotendieck Witt group Witt group of R is defined as follows. It's denoted Grotendieck Witt zero of R. Sometimes just Grotendieck Witt of R, but I'll use that later for a spectrum. So let me go with Grotendieck Witt zero for the group for the moment. And what you do is you just take ISO classes of such forms, symmetric and unimodular forms over R. And that is actually an abelian monoid under direct sum or like orthogonal sum. You can just take two of those forms and add them. That gives you a new one. And then like as usual in K theory, you would group complete. Group means a group completion. And that defines the Grotendieck grid group of R. Okay, and then uh, there's another variant of that he invented before the Grotendieck Witt group that's called the Witt group. The Witt group of R. That is defined as follows. You just take, I mean, and let me denote it as W0R. I think usually it's just denoted WR, but please do not uh, confuse that with the Witt vectors. It's the Witt group here. It's something totally different than the Witt vectors. And this is just, you basically do the same. You do ISO classes of such forms, forms over R. But then you don't group complete that, but you quotient. And you quotient it by so called metabolic forms. Metabolic forms. So, what does metabolic mean? So metabolic means so form, such a non-degenerate form is called metabolic if it admits if it admits a Lagrangian, a Lagrangian. And I, I hope most of you know what a Lagrangian is. Lagrangian is basically a maximal isotropic subspace, but uh, one has to be a little bit careful if does that over arbitrary rings, what maximal means. So here's the way I want to say that. So that's a subspace, submodule, L, 
inside of my given module P. So P is a module which has a, has a unimodular form and I want to say what it means to be a Lagrangian for that. And I want, uh, that means it admits a submodule such that if I take the form Q and restrict it to L, so then it's zero. That would mean the subspace is isotropic. And then what, what does maximum mean? One way to say that is as follows. You look at the sequence where, where you map L by the inclusion to P. A P is identified with the dual of P. That's by means of the unimodular form. And then you just take the dual map of I that goes to the dual of L. And maximum means this is exact. An exact sequence, short exact sequence. Right, it somehow says I is, I is somehow the same size as the dual of I. Like over vector spaces, another way of saying maximal would be, would be that it has half the dimension and that is basically what we do here. Okay, so that is uh, what the Grotendieck wit and the wit group are, which are very uh, classical subjects. And there's one little thing here in my definition of the wit group. You see, I didn't group complete anywhere. So what I do here is actually I take a quotient as monoids or as a billion monoids. And of course the claim is, I mean, I call it the wit group. So the claim is it's a group. So let me uh, collect this and another property in this little proposition. Namely, the first thing is that W zero R is a group. And the inverse actually of a given uh, form is just given by the negative of that form. You can just work out that a form plus the negative of, of that form is actually metabolic. It proves that the inverse is given by the negative of that form. And I mean, maybe I should say under a direct sum or orthogonal sum. Okay, that's the first property. And the second property um, is that we can look at the following sequence of the leading groups. So we can take K theory, K naught of R. I hope everyone knows what K naught of R is. This is just the Grotendy group, the group completion of isomorphism classes of finite generated projective modules over R. And then there's a map called hyperbolic, I'll say a word about that in a second, going to the Grotendieck wit group. And then there's a map from the Grotendieck wit group down to the wit group. And what is that map? That map well just takes a class, I mean a, a form, which are the representatives of classes in Grotendieck wit and sends it to the respective class in the wit group. So that letter is obviously a quotient map. And what is the first map? The hyperbolic map will just take a finite projective module P and it will send it to the following uh, form. Form on the underlying module P plus dual P. And the form is the classical hyperbolic form. So it has like as a matrix, if you want to write forms as matrix, it has this form. In other words, it somehow combines P and DP and DP and P if you write it out as a symmetric bilinear form. It's a canonical form you have. And the statement is that this sequence is exact. I mean, it's not, I mean, the hyperbolic map is not necessarily injective, but everything I've written down is exact. And yes, so the first part of that proposition, the fact that, I mean, W0 is a group is, is, is a nice exercise. For the second part, you actually need to think a bit because what does this mean that this is exact? This means the wit group is also the quotient of the Grotendieck wit group by hyperbolic forms, right? But by definition, the, the wit group was a quotient of, of forms by metabolic forms. So you need to prove a little statement, namely that after group completion or after stabilization, metabolic and hyperbolic is the same. And this is actually a little bit tricky. I mean, there are a bunch of ways of proving that, but it's not entirely trivial. It's a statement about forms you have to verify. Okay, good. And in fact, actually the main result I wanna talk about today is kind of a higher generalization of this proposition. But before I talk about that, let me give you an example of this proposition or of the situation that arises. That's the following example. And that is, let's look at the case of the integers. I mean, how does our short exact sequence or our exact sequence look in this case? So I have K naught of the integers, Grotendieck 
vit naught of the integers and then vit naught of the integers down to zero. And um, well, I guess most of you will probably know what k naught of the integers is, namely that's a copy of z. And how does the isomorphism go? Well, the isomorphism is given by taking the rank. Just take a finite projective module over the integer and you take its rank. And then it actually turns out if you want to study the vit group of the integers, this is also z. And what is the isomorphism here? That's a signature. Right, when you have a symmetric bilinear form, you can always take its signature, which is by, I guess, Sylvester theorem well defined. And that, in fact, will give you an isomorphism of the vit group to the integers. And then it turns out that the Grotenlich vit group is actually, in this case, just the direct sum z plus z. And the map here is the inclusion into the second factor, and this is a projection to the first factor. And what is the isomorphism from the Grotendieck Witt group of the integers? So in other words, the group completion of uh, symmetric unimodular forms. Well, I mean, you have two invariants. You still have the signature. Well, signature is, of course, well-defined for classes in here. And the second invariant is actually rank minus signature divided by two. So in fact, there's a little lemma Namely that if you have a unimodular form over the integers, that rank minus signature is divisible by two. And then you see this diagram actually commutes and that is how it looks like. And in fact, it's not entirely trivial to prove that the grotten wit group over of the integers is actually equivalent to, to Z plus Z, I mean, given by rank and signature. So, I mean, I think, I mean, one overkill proof is to use the classification of indefinite forms over the integers. That is well known, I guess, by Hasse Minkowski and other people. And I mean, this is classified by three invariants, namely rank, signature, and type. And in the grotenik witt group, we can always add indefinite forms to make every form indefinite. And then because of stabilization, the type actually goes away. It's not an invariant anymore. And then you see that, I mean, you get that. But this is most likely uh, the most overkill proof ever. Anyways, <laughs> this is an isomorphism. Okay, good. So that is, uh, in fact, the second thing I want to I wanna generalize in this talk. Good. So I don't know, are there questions? What questions are there? Okay, then I get to the higher, more fancy stuff. So. What we want to do now is similar to the way we have higher k groups. It turns out we have higher Grotendieck Witt groups. And they are just defined the same way. It's the following definition. That is just the higher Grotendieck Witt groups. Higher Grotendieck Witt groups of R are the higher k groups of the category of unimodular symmetric forms so in fact, I mean, these are the homotopy groups, uh, homotopy groups of the Grotendieck Witt spectrum. And I should maybe say connective Grotendieck Witt spectrum, and, but that's the only thing I'll ever talk about today. Spectrum defined as Grotendieck Witt of R as just you take the category of unimodular symmetric forms. forms and I guess you group complete that as an infinite space. That is, I guess, the way you would define K theory of a symmetric monoidal category under direct sum. And then you just do that to the category of unimodular symmetric forms. Oh, shit. that was not supposed to happen. I'm sorry for swearing. Okay, <laughs> good. So that is, uh, 
how the higher Groten liquid groups are defined. And, and pretty much, I mean, I, you know, I wrote it as group completion, but there's a bunch of different K-theory machines and you can run that through all of these K-theory machines, but eventually it's just K, K groups of a category. Okay, and that uh, is the thing that was studied a lot actually. And the main theorem and the applications I will talk about today, which we proved over the course of a long time now, actually the following. And uh, that was proven by, I guess, all the nine authors. I, I, I like to write hashtag nine to refer to that. And so what is the theorem? The theorem is a generalization of the exact sequence I had above. Namely, it says that there is a fiber sequence, fiber sequence of connective spectra, of connective spectra, Connective spectra of the following form. We have K theory of R. Then in the middle, we have the Gordon de Witt spectrum of R. And there's again this hyperbolic map, which, as I explained before, takes the projective module to P plus DP. But this is actually, um, this actually factors over the homotopy orbits of a certain action of the group with two elements on the K theory spectrum. And how does this action go? Uh, this action of C2 will just send, I mean, the generator of C2 will just send the module P to its dual. So that will actually, in fact, define an action on the K-theory spectrum. And then the claim is that the cofiber of this is something which is well known, which I denote LS classical R. <laughs> Okay, so what is LS classical R? Here, LS classical R is an L theory spectrum. Spectrum whose homotopy groups, homotopy groups are Ranitsky's classical L groups. I mean, whatever classical means, symmetric L groups. Find someone in the 80s, which are denoted, which I denote classical N of R. So that's an L spectrum. And I will say a bunch of words about this L spectrum in a second. Let me just say this L spectrum or these L groups are actually higher variants of the Witt group. Pretty much the same way that the Grotendieck Witt groups are higher variants of the Grotendieck Witt zero. These uh, Ranitsky's L groups are higher variants of the of the Witt group. And in fact, if you take apply pi zero to that fiber sequence of spectra I have down there, then I will actually uh, you will actually recover the short exact sequence I had at the beginning. And why is that? Well, there you didn't see the homotopy orbit C2 on the K-theory spectrum, but that's because obviously taking a module, a projective module to its dual acts as the identity on K0. Right, if you, I mean, if you just think of it over the integers or so, the dual module has the same rank as the module itself. And in fact, because every projective module is a retract of a free one, you can actually check that on free modules. So it does act as the identity. So you won't see this homotopy orbit C2 thing. And let me also note that I could have, of course, written that whole fiber sequence as a long exact sequence of groups. So the point being, if I want to calculate the higher Grotendieck Witt groups, I have to understand the homotopy groups of this KR homotopy C2, the C2 action on the K-theory spectrum and these L groups. That's the real content of that theorem. And uh, I should actually say that uh, the theorem was known if, if two is a unit in the ring. But it was kind of a big open problem if this is true if two is not a, uh, sorry, yes, if two is not a unit in the ring. So that's the main content of what we do here. Uh, hi, Thomas. It's uh, Thomas. Uh, Thomas. Oh, there seems to be something wrong with my mic. I, I wanted to ask if there was a manifold theoretic um, interpretation of this sequence. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was just kicked out of the meeting for a second for whatever reason. Sorry, let me just. I think I have to reconnect my iPad first. How, is this, how did this happen? This happened before. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, very good question. So I haven't really. Well, yeah. I guess let let's talk about that in the end, okay? Because somehow. Let me first explain what the cycles in these groups are and so on and so forth, and then I can sort of try to give an answer. But I mean, I, I don't have a fully sort of satisfactory answer to that question. Let me already say that. So it's a very good question though. Okay, sorry. I mean, I was kicked out for a second out of the meeting. Can everyone hear me now again? So that I can go keep going. That's good on my end. I don't know what happened. So. Okay, anyways, um, right. So let me, let me say a few words about this um, A groups. So, um, what is the idea Idea for these L groups? Um, so, the idea is that instead of considering, I mean, before when we defined the WIT group, we just, uh, we just uh, considered unimodular forms on projective modules. And now we want to consider unimodular forms, unimodular forms, or I mean, I might, I might drop symmetric at some point, but it's always supposed to be symmetric unimodular forms on chain complexes over R, complexes over R, over R, instead of just simply projective modules. And more precisely, I want to look at, uh, more precisely, I want to look at chain complexes, chain complexes X, which, uh, which are quasi-isomorphic or presented, represented by a chain complex, complex of finite projective modules, modules concentrated, traded in degrees, degrees, minus n to zero. And this is homological grading, homological grading, right? So I'm just saying it, it's supposed to be zero outside of that range. And I mean, I could say that a little bit more invariantly, it's a perfect complex with tor amplitude in minus n zero. Okay, and so, um, and, and then I wanna consider forms on that. What is, what is the form on that, a symmetric form? Symmetric form on that, on such an X. X is simply given by a, by a map from the homotopy orbit C2 of X tensor over Rx. And that is of course the drive tensor product. I guess I don't need to drive because I said everything was projective. Then maybe I don't have to drive. And it's just a map into R. And in fact, I want this to be to go to R minus N. So it goes to a shift of R such that the junk map, the induced map, induced map, which goes from X shifted by N into the dual of X is an equivalence. Right, so if you think about it, if the, if the chain complex sits concentrated in degree minus n to zero, then the dual will be concentrated in degree zero to n. So for this to have any chance to be equivalent to its dual, you have to implement this shift. And this is why I somehow look at forms of degree n going to r shifted by minus n. And we call those, I mean, we call those strictly n-dimensional, strictly n-dimensional forms. Or maybe again, I should say unimodular symmetric, but I will drop that. Okay, and so once I, once I consider that, then I mean, using those, I can basically copy the definition of the Witt group, namely the symmetric classical ends L group is then just defined to be, just take these strictly n-dimensional forms over R, isoclasses of those, and then you quotient 
by the respective notion of metabolic forms. Metabolic forms, and maybe let me not sort of, I mean, basically the definition I gave earlier of metabolic forms repeats, except instead of exact, you say fiber sequence. Okay, and well then by definition, by definition, we have that L zero, so L classical zero, S symmetric of R is just given by the Witt group, right? Because then you just have a chain complex which sits in degree zero, concentrated by a projective module, and everything reduces to what we've had before. And uh, you can also say that give a fairly explicit description of the first Witt group. I mean, say explicit algebraic description in terms of so-called formations or torsion linking forms, if you know what that is. So this can also be understood super explicitly. And the higher groups are a priori way more complicated than that, right? Because a priori you now need to look at chain complexes. So everything becomes a little bit homotopical and fuzzy and it might be a little bit inexplicit what's going on. But the thing is that in very many situations, the, for example, if R is a Dedekind ring, and that is kind of the case we care about, namely the integers, or if two is invertible in R, then these groups, these groups are in a certain sense two periodic. Let me put that in quotation marks because in reality they are four periodic. And if you shift by two, you get a description in terms of uh, so-called minus one symmetric forms. But so the point is that because of this periodicity, they are kind of very computable, are much easier, easier than K groups or grotendieck witt groups. Right, and actually Ranitsky has over 20, 30 years given a lot of computation and proven a lot of abstract uh, structure theorems for these L groups. So in fact, actually in practice, like we can always compute these L groups. So going back to our, our fiber sequence up there, this somehow the, the upshot is that we have somehow, uh, we have sandwiched our our grotendieck witt spectrum, the one we care about in between two things which might be easier. So the L, L theory is actually computable. And then of course, K theory, algebraic K theory is kind of hard, but you know, I, I don't think you have any right to ask us to compute grotendieck witt groups if you can't even compute the K theory groups. Because after all, grotendieck witt groups are just forms on projective modules. If you have no clue about projective modules, I mean, this is at least as complicated as K theory. Okay, so that is kind of the, significance of the theorem above. And well, if there are no questions, I will go to talk about some applications of that fiber sequence above. Okay, so the first application is that using this, we can actually settle the conjecture of Berwick and Karubi, which says, I mean, And what does the Beric, I mean, this conjecture say? Uh, the conjecture says that the gordon leak witt spectrum of the integers, this has a canonical map to the gordon leak witt spectrum of the integers where you invert two. And recall, I told you earlier, everything about forms becomes much easier once two is invertible than symmetric and quadratic forms are the same, polarization works well. So the letter is actually much easier. And the statement is that this is actually a two adic equivalence. And so this means actually uh, two adically, or actually it's, a, let me say two local equivalents. Everything's finitely generated here. And so you can combine that with another observation which you get out of our fiber sequence, which says the following. I mean that always you can look at the Groten Witt groups of any ring and you invert two on the outside, right? Don't look at two local behavior, but you invert two. Then it turns out that our fiber sequence above, where is it? Here. In this fiber sequence, actually, you always have a splitting from the Grotendieck Witt group back to the K group. 
and then to the homotopy orbits, but that will just basically be multiplication by two, that map, right? Because you send a module to a module plus the dual. And well, once you invert two, this is actually an equivalence, of course. So, okay, where did I end up being here? I mean, how many pages does this map up? Okay, so what, what does this say? This says uh, that always, uh, this is isomorphic to the K-theory inverting two, and then the C2 orbits, because homotopy orbits then after inverting two become algebraic. And then you add these kind of classical L groups. L groups, classical N, I guess R, one half, and I should put a star, I guess. Okay, so what's, what does this tell us? So this tells you that you can too locally compute compute uh, coordinate grid of the integers and you can compute it after inverting two. And as a result, we get a computation. We can compute coordinate grid of the integers, which was basically in some sense the biggest open problem in the field. And maybe I can sort of, if this works, give you the answer. Okay, here it is. I don't know, this is just to, to give you a taste of how the answer looks like to compute coordinate grid of the integers. So you see, uh, and I put the little s up there, coordinate grid s of the integers, the s refers to symmetric because there are actually other flavors and most of what I'm saying works for all these flavors. And you see the point is that it's expressed in terms of, in terms of K theory, of the integers, but only the odd torsion in K-theory of the integers. And these groups are actually known until degree 20,000 by work of Weibel. So basically we can compute Gordon de of the integers until degree 20,000. And in fact, if you assume the Kumar Van Diver conjecture, these groups, I mean, the, the, the order of these groups is completely known. They can be, it can be expressed in terms of, I guess, numerators of Bernoulli numbers and they're conjecturally cyclic which is again known until degree 20,000. Okay, good. That was one application of our fiber sequence. And in fact, you see somehow, the way you prove these results is now you just like basically prove a result in K-theory and a result in L-theory and you combine them. That's kind of how, how this uh, combination in terms of coordinate width theory works out. Okay, good. So that's called Nick of the integers. And let me give you one last application that is, uh, you can settle what is called the homotopy limit problem. Limit problem. And that is, um, that is the question whether, I mean, there's always a map and I, and I guess I wanna say for rings of integers. Okay, a ring of integers in a number field, in a number field like the integers, for example, itself. And so the statement is there's always a map from the Groten de Witt group into you take the K theory of OK, and then the homotopy C2 fixed points. Again, under this action, and this is just obtained by observing that, well, by definition, if you have a unimodular form, you have an isomorphism from P to DP. And that gives rise to, to a homotopy fixed points in that in that K-theory spectrum. And the statement is that this is a two local, a two adic equivalence, equivalence on connective covers. Covers. <laughs> so that question was previously answered under the assumption that two is a unit in the ring. And now we can, I mean, somehow using this kind of L-theory tricks, we can reduce it to that solution, which is given by, I guess, very Karubi and Schlichting. Okay, good. These are the applications of the main result I'm gonna talk about. And well, I guess now I wanna explain how, how we prove this result. And this is something which has to do with algebraic surgery and cobordism categories. And okay, so let me, let me, I mean, this has basically been, I mean, like the setup I'm gonna present now has been actually worked out by, I mean, starting by Ranitsky as an abstract setup to define these L groups. And then it has been later refined by Jacob Lurie. And so the setup, we term the setup Poincaré infinity categories. Okay, so 
what is the Poincare infinity category? So you could look at pairs of C, a stable infinity category, a small stable infinity category. And you want to have a functor copper from C up to spectra. That's a functor. And this functor is not exact, but it has a bunch of nice properties. The first property is that, uh, sorry, copper, by the way, is the Greek, an old Greek letter for Q. Um, copper of zero is equal to zero. So it's a reduced functor. Second property this functor is supposed to have is that there exists an equivalence D, thought of as a duality from C up to C, such that we have an equivalence copper of X plus Y. So if you just insert the sum of two objects, that's equivalent to copper X plus copper Y plus, and then you have a bilinear part and that is just given by maps from C to the mapping spectrum in C from X to the dual of Y. And I hope I got the variant right. Yes, that's contravariant. Okay, so that's the second equation and the most important one. And in fact, actually, if you, if you stare at this equation, you see that this actually uniquely determines the functor D. So basically, I could just say that the functor D is, uh, is an equivalence. It, it exists and is an equivalence. And then there's a third condition, which I won't really talk about much today. But I mean, there's a condition which I say, I, I call copper preserves finite geometric realizations. Um, for those of you who, who are well versed in, in good really calculus, this, I mean, implies that it's analytic, actually. It's I mean, under, under one and two, this is equivalent to saying it's analytic. And so basically this second, I mean, this just says it's a quadratic functor in the setting, in the setting of good really calculus and that the second cross effect is actually uh, co-represented by this duality equivalence D. That's another way of saying it. And under these assumptions, we will call that pair C and copper is called a Poincaré infinity category. I mean, I guess Jacob Lurie introduced this notion but didn't give it a name, so we felt free to call it Poincaré infinity category. And so this is just a very abstract setup to talk about forms. So let me just uh, give you the one example you should have in mind. Example. And this is just the example where you let C just be the perfect derived category of your commutative ring R. And of course, I will always consider the perfect derived category as a stable infinity category. And what is the functor copper? Copper is a symmetric functor. Copper applied to a perfect module X is just given by, you take, well, the spectrum of symmetric bilinear forms on X. So this is just R linear map from X tensor over R X into R, and then you take the homotopy C2 fixed points. All right, that's the same thing you would do if you, you would abstractly want to say, what is the group of symmetric bilinear forms on a projective module? Then you would just say it's, it's maps from X tensor R X to R, which are invariant under the flip C2 action. Uh, so hello, uh, Nicholas, this is Ezra. Uh, wh what is the letter? What is that functor called? I can't understand the uh, name. Copper. I mean, it's cool. What's that? It's an old Greek Q. So the thing is, yes. Could you write it in another font so we can recognize it? I can recognize it another time. I can't even. Could you write it like in block letters instead of script because it looks no, like every other letter? It looks like okay. a lollipop. Oh, I <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I sometimes call it lollipop. Anyways, <laughs> it's the copper. So the point is somehow Jacob and most people call these functors Q for quadratic. But somehow there's a lot of Qs coming up in that business, among others, the Q construction. So we were looking for another letter. And that's an old Greek Q. Yeah, okay. Is that good, Ezra? Do, I don't know. 
Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I learned a new letter today. Great. <laughs> the lollipop. I mean, I'm sure you have seen lollipops. Anyways, um, okay. <laughs> Good. So, um, okay. So that is the spectrum of symmetric bilinear forms. Of symmetric bilinear forms. So basically, what somehow. What this whole formalism of these Poincaré infinity categories is supposed to do is like you just have an infinity category like, like perfect complexes and you have a functor which tells you what kind of forms you look at, right? There's different flavors of forms, which I don't really want to mention today, but you can also look at what is called quadratic forms or epsilon symmetric, symmetric forms and so on. And you will just encode that by looking at slightly different functors. It's kind of what this abstract uh, formalism is supposed to do for you. Okay, so that's the example. And now the point is that once you, once you have that abstract setup where you know what a form is, you can totally talk about uh, unimodular forms. And that's the following definition. And in this business, they are called Poincaré objects. The Poincaré object, and maybe I wanted to make everything blue, yellow, all my definitions. The Poincaré object. of dimension n in, in a Poincaré infinity category. C comma kappa is given by, by a pair, by an object x in C and well, uh, not uh, unimodular form of degree n and a form Q, which is a map from the n sphere into copper of x. So in other words, actually uh, an element in pi n of that spectrum, or actually a little bit more point in the n space of that spectrum, such that uh, the induced map, and I'll explain what the induced map is in a second, induced map. So I claim whenever I have such a, such a class, such a map from Sn into copper of x, that I get an induced map from the n-fold shift of x into the dual of x. And I want to say that this is an equivalence. Right, so basically I'm just taking everything from what I did earlier where I said, well, the copper encodes what I mean by symmetric bilinear forms and then I have the unimodularity condition in this generality. And of course, uh, how do I get this induced map? So this is just the image, this is just the image, image of Q under the following map where you can go from copper of X can double everything and go to copper of x plus x. This is just you pull back along the addition on x, right? There's a map in every stable infinity category, there's a map from x plus x to x, which like on, I mean, think of like the addition on an abelian group, pull back along that map. And then this actually guy is copper x plus copper x plus maps in C from x to dx. Well, and then I guess I, I just project down to, I guess how do I do that now? I project down to map C, X, DX. And now if I start with an element a map from SN into copper X, then I get a map from SN into this mapping spectrum, or in other words, a map from the n-fold shift of X to DX. Okay. That is the abstract generality in which I, can talk about Poincaré objects. And of so, course, uh, uh, this is David Ayala. I had a quick question. Is, so you mentioned that D is unique if it exists given COPA. Uh, it, is the, does the data of D determine COPA? I mean, for every, I mean, if, you, if I give you, if you give me a D, which is actually, you know, you need it to be coherently sort of self dual. So what, what happens is like, if you just have a functor from C up to C, this, I mean, in no way does determine a copper. But what happens if you, I mean, you know, if it's a homo, I mean, there's a C2 action on the right. category, stable infinity categories, given by sending C to C up. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's a homotopy fixed point for that, okay. it does determine a choice of copper, I mean, the one where you take homotopy fixed points on map X, DX. 
But the point mm -hmm. being that Sopa is actually way more than that. So right. it's, I mean, in fact, this, this kind of duality would determine the homogeneous part of your quadratic functor, but that's also an, a linear part. Uh -huh. So yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, it's actually a very beautiful way of encoding this coherent C2 action on categories. And I should say maybe uh, Markus Spitzweg and others before have considered the setup where you just have such a coherent action, a coherent duality on your stable infinity category, but the setup with quadratic functors is actually more flexible. And in fact, I don't know if I will get to that, but this is actually the key point in proving our main theorem is to allow this additional flexibility because we will look at the quadratic functor in, in a few minutes which has a linear part and it's neither homogeneous nor co-homogeneous. Okay, great, thanks. Right. Okay, so and I mean of course why is this called Poincaré? Maybe I should give a little bit of an example. <laughs> Let me do that as a side example. Example. This is just, uh, if, I, if I look at the category, the Poincaré infinity category D perf of the integers and the functor copper S that I introduced before, the thing just encoding symmetric bilinear forms. Then uh, if M is a compact, compact oriented manifold, manifold of dimension N, then the claim is that I take the co-chains of M that is canonically, canonically a Poincaré object. And why is that? So the integral code chains, well, I can just look at the cup product, right? So I have the cup product defines for me a map going to code chains M and it's actually an e infinity structure. So it will factor over the homotopy C2 orbits. And then I just have evaluation at the fundamental class that will just define for me an element in C brackets minus N. And then Poincaré duality actually, I mean, this is like the, the pairing, this is the form. And Pon Poincaré duality shows that it's unimodular. It is unimodular. And this is why these guys are called Poincaré objects. Because in fact, this of course works more generally than for a compact manifold. You just need a, what is called an oriented Poincaré duality space for that. Okay. So, can I, uh, so in some sense, does this show that the cup I products, which I guess are the coherence data for the C2 invariance, are part of the Poincaré duality? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I yeah. I mean, in a sense, mm -hmm. I mean, you could say that Poincaré reality is just determined by the underlying bilinear mm -hmm. form, mm -hmm. but here yeah. we really take advantage of the fact that it has a symmetric refinement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, in this language, if you follow this notation I've introduced, then yes, absolutely. The cup I, all the cup I's are part of that. Uh, I see, theory. I see. And second question, well, is there a lift of this example to the sphere spectrum? <laughs> Very good, very good question. And I mean, I guess the answer is yes. And in fact, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, I guess the answer is yes when you replace oriented by framed. Oh, yes. I mean, okay. for every cohomology theory, there's a notion of being oriented over that cohomology theory and mm -hmm. the fundamental class. And then I guess the answer is yes. I see. Okay. So, yeah. In, well, I guess, strictly speaking, the answer is no. If you're just oriented, but if you're framed, then the answer is yes. Okay, and yeah, I mean, this is a, the point of all of that. You can just run that over ring spectra and then arbitrary stable infinity categories. Okay, so, but now, uh, now we know what a Poincaré duality uh, space or Poincaré object is. And then we also want to say what a Lagrangian is and a metabolic object. So let me do that. So in this generality, a Lagrangian in a Poincaré object, object is given by, given by a map L to X. I mean, I guess X is my Poincaré object and with a pass from the restriction of Q to L. 
So recall that Q is actually a class in copper of X. And by restriction, I just mean I pull it back to L, right? The copper was a contravariant functor, so I can restrict my abstract sort of forms to L. And I want to say that I have a path to zero form. That's uh, the fancy way of saying it's isotropic. And then you want to say such that the sequence, well, now you do L shifted by N. So that's the dimension of your Poincaré object that maps to X shifted by N, which is now equivalent by our form to DX. And then you go to DL. So this is I and this is dual I with the null homotopy, null homotopy induced by the path by the path is a fiber sequence, fiber sequence. And here you need to recall that a fiber sequence is not just uh, two maps, but it's two maps and a null homotopy. And the null homotopy is induced by the witness, which witnesses that the form as you restrict it to L is zero. Okay, so that's what it means to be a Lagrangian. And then, I mean, in this case, we call X metabolic. We call X metabolic. Bolic. Okay, so um, that is this. And then I can just define in this generality, the L groups, L, N, C, copper, is just defined as before the width groups. You just say n dimensional Poincare objects, objects, modulo metabolics. Now oh, maybe I want the line modulo metabolics. Okay. And well, I guess now I've introduced for you these uh, higher generalizations of the width groups, these L groups. And I guess there's a proposition or a construction really, which is first given in, in slightly less generality by Ranitsky and then in the generality of Poincaré infinity categories by Jacob Lurie is namely that there is a spectrum. There is a spectrum, a canonical spectrum L of C copper such that the homotopy groups pi n of this is actually the n's L group. L n C copper. And note that this is, in my opinion, quite remarkable because somehow if you, if you know how to construct these spectra, these K-theory similar spectra, then it's very rare that you actually can just describe all homotopy groups. But here we can. The spectrum, by definition, has just all these L groups as homotopy groups. And this is, I think, eventually the reason why these L spectra are actually much easier, much, much uh, more controllable than the actual K-theory spectra. Okay, so that is what, what Jacob uh, presents. And now I want to somehow, in order to, to get a fiber sequence, at the, as I explained at the beginning with the Groten de Witt groups, the idea that we have was to, to place, maybe I write that idea, I mean, place Groten de Witt theory, Groten de Witt theory in the same world. <laughs> Right, so what I want to do is I want to define groten de Witt groups also in the generality of a Poincaré infinity category, an infinity category with the notion of forms. And that leads to the following definition. So the definition is the following, namely that, I mean, again, C and copper is going to be a Poincaré infinity category. And what I want to do now is, I, I mean, let me first define the groten de Witt, Witt zero group for you. So recall at the beginning, the groten de Witt group of a ring was just the group completion of unimodular forms. And maybe if you know a little bit about how K-theory works, like K-theory, you know, K-theory of a ring can also be defined as group completion of finite projective modules. But once you pass to the derived category of a ring, there's a 
slightly different description of K-theory. Namely, you just say, take perfect complexes and then you quotient by short exact sequences. Or in other words, in a short exact sequence, you might make the outer two terms, uh, the sum of the outer two terms uh, equal to the middle term. And what I'm going to do now is a similar description of the Groten de Witt group in terms of complexes. And how does this work? And uh, so here what we want to say is we want to look at, in fact, now I guess I say zero dimensional Poincaré duality, Poincaré objects, objects in C. Right, this makes sense now. I've defined that in this generality. And then I want to quotient this by the following relation akin to quotienting by short exact sequences. I want to say if X admits a Lagrangian L in X, then, then I want to impose a relation. Namely, the relation is supposed to be that the class of X in this group is then isomorphic to the class of the hyperbolic form on L plus DL. So, or said it differently, you want to say that metabolic, metabolic equals hyperbolic. And if you're working with rings where two is invertible, this might sound a little bit weird, but so in general, it's, it's just far from being the same, admitting a Lagrangian and being hyperbolic. So we do impose this relation here. And you should think of this as a sort of short exact sequence in that realm, because somehow really by definition, a Lagrangian led to a short exact sequence with L and X and DL. And so basically we are splitting that short exact sequence in a certain sense. Here. And recall at the beginning when I wrote down the short exact sequence over arbitrary rings, I said the hard thing is to prove that after group completion, metabolic and hyperbolic is the same. So in fact, this, this relation is automatic in the group completion definition of Groten de Witt groups. But in this abstract generality, we want to uh, impose it. Okay, that is the Groten de Witt zero group in our setting. And then, actually, how are the higher Groten de Witt groups are defined? So the Groten de Witt, de Witt spectrum or connective spectrum, connective spectrum. GW C copa is defined as follows. So it's GW C copa is defined to be omega of the realization of a certain category, a cobordism category, C copa. It's a connective spectrum to denote by this. And what is this cobordism category? So this category here is the cobordism infinity category, algebraic cobordism infinity category. This is highly inspired by the cobordism category of manifolds under that functor, which takes a manifold to its associated Poincaré space. And what are the objects? The objects are actually minus one dimensional Poincaré objects. I mean, it's a little funny that, that you have minus one here, but there's nothing stopping you from, from allowing minus one dimensional object in that algebraic setup. And somehow this follows the convention from manifold theory that cobordism categories are usually denoted by the dimension of the cobordisms and not the dimension of the objects. So the objects here are minus one dimensional so that the morphisms are actually zero dimensional. So the morphisms are basically cobordisms, but what is the cobordisms? The, the morphisms from XQ to X prime Q prime, they are actually given by null bordisms of the direct sum. So these are actually Lagrangians, Lagrangians in X Q plus X prime minus Q prime. So that is, I mean, for one, I should have said that whenever you, I mean, I said before I have a Poincaré object, then the co-chains are a Poincaré object. Uh, sorry, if I have a manifold, then the co-chains are a Poincaré object. And if you actually have a null bordism of your manifold, it turns out by actually uh, Poincaré duality with boundary that the co-chains on that null bordism are actually form a Lagrangian in the co-chains of that manifold. 
So in fact, what I'm doing here is I'm just going to talk about morphisms being cobordisms in that algebraic setup. Okay, I, I don't know if this entirely makes sense, but this is uh, how you define this cobordism infinity category. And by definition, I mean, you can, you can shift it around. You can, you can put, put arbitrary dimensions n here, and then it receives, of course, a functor from the geometric cobordism category. With the functor I described early, earlier, the assignment which takes a manifold to its cochain, that will then refine to a functor of cobordism infinity categories if you tweak the dimensions so that it works out. Okay, and then the grotten wit spectrum is just defined as taking the loops on the geometric realization of that category. And some of this category has symmetric monoidal structure coming from direct sum of like Poincare objects, and that's why this is actually going to be a, co a connective spectrum. A quick question. Oh, this is David Ayala. Uh, is, is taking iterated loops compatible with, with replacing the objects by different dimensional Poincare objects? No, it's actually not. Yeah, right. Um, exactly. I mean, actually you can, I mean, it turns out, I mean, you can do that. And uh, actually it is true that if you do that twice, then it is somehow. So what, I mean, if you, you can do that by, I mean, you, you get a, what's called a positive omega spectrum. If you do that, you somehow shift the dimension by one. I mean, if you, if you do the worst, I mean, does this make sense? Yeah, I'm following. A fancier way of saying that is actually you shift the quadratic functor, the copper. You can just suspend or desuspend the copper. And what turns out is if you do that twice, somehow you do it again, then, then somehow it loops, but not if you do it zero times, so to say. Yes, so this is actually, in fact, the, the kind of universal property of that construction. So let me, yeah, this okay, is thanks. actually the, the last thing I want to say, and then maybe I should end. I mean, I guess I'm running out of time, right? So I was supposed uh, to speak now, right? Uh, you had 90 minutes booked, so okay. well, you have another 25 minutes. No, that's awesome. Man. And I can definitely write down the main theorem I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so here, here's the main, and let me say main abstract theorem. So that's so to say the blueprint print version of the theorem I had earlier. And that says that in this generality, so for a Poincaré infinity category, Poincaré infinity category, there's a fiber sequence. Fiber sequence. I mean, I guess exactly like our earlier fiber sequence, you have the K theory of C. I mean, the K theory doesn't depend on copper, of course, it just depends on the underlying stable infinity category. And then there's the hyperbolic style map to the scroten wit guy, and this does depend on copper. And then there's the L theory, and I guess because I only defined connective quote and liquid theory, I should take the connective cover of connective spectrum. Hey, hey, Tomas. Uh, I think the the uh, screen share has stalled somehow. Oh, the screen share has stopped. Oh no! How did this happen? Um, yeah. How can I do it again? I have to disconnect and reconnect. Connect or something. Stop mirroring. Okay. That's good. I can see what you wrote now. Okay. Can you see the main yep. abstract? <laughs> yeah, great. So Thanks. Let me read it again. So for a Poincaré infinity category, there's a fiber sequence, which takes a K theory and you again have this action of the homotopy C2 that comes from the duality. Then you have the grotten wit spectrum or connective spectrum in that generality that depends on the copper. And then you have the L theory spectrum in that generality. And in a sense, this totally somehow does what we were hoping it does, namely it totally somehow proves such a fiber sequence in full generality. You just have to somehow define everything in the same generality, namely in the generality of this Poincaré infinity categories, and then you can somehow prove such a fiber sequence. And maybe in order to answer David's question, I mean, there's a slight addendum, moreover, moreover, the grotten wit as well as L have motivic style universal properties. Properties. So grotten wit is in a sense a universal additive, additive invariant. 
where I mean additive, you know, in the in the sense of K theory, additive means that it sort of preserves split Verdier sequences, and there's a notion of split Verdier sequences in this Poincaré infinity business, and it's a universal guy which sort of sends those to fiber sequences, and L is a universal Bordism invariant functor. Bordism invariant. So again, you can somehow make sense of what it means for a functor to be Bordism invariant. You can just define cobordism Poincaré categories, and then it's universal and that's set up. Yes, and these kind of fiber sequences, I was, I mean, this very style fiber sequences, this, this leads to the fact that if you do, I mean, if you do the construction David uh, asked about, namely sort of shifting the dimension around that you get certain D loops. So you get, in other words, a positive omega spectrum. And this actually does give you also a non-connective version of quoten de Witt theory, so that this theorem is true uh, without having to say connective cover and, and uh, uh, connective spectra here. Okay, good. So that is somehow the main abstract theorem. And I think it's it's really nice because somehow it, it took us a while to realize that you can place all the invariants in this generality and the fiber sequence is just true in this generality. But now somehow the main question is actually, of course, if you prove an abstract theorem, what does it do for you in practice? And so it's actually, actually the most non-trivial part of that whole work is actually how to see how, how theorem one, theorem one above follows. So theorem one was the one about the concrete fiber sequence. Oh, no, sorry, I want to underline in a more straight way. So let's go back and see what theorem one was. I mean, I don't even know if I called it theorem one, to be honest, unfortunately. So that was kind of this theorem about the fiber sequence, that one here. So recall here we were totally different. So both things were different. We had here, this defines this quoten with thing defined as a group completion. And we had this L theory spectrum where, where I put a sort of Tor amplitude condition. I, I insisted that these chain complexes sit in a very specific range of degrees, which I didn't do in my abstract definition of, of L groups of uh, Poincaré infinity category. But somehow, in order to see that, you now have to compare these kind of new fancy invariants, which we newly defined, to the, to the classical old ones that we act in actuality care about. And this is actually, I think, somehow one of the most crucial ideas here. And this is namely to consider the correct Poincaré infinity category. And what is the correct Poincaré infinity category? It's the following one. Um, let me just see if I can erase everything. So there is a functor, functor which we denote copper G from the perfect derived category of a ring up to spectra called the genuine, genuine quadratic functor or we call it the genuine quadratic functor, quadratic functor. Because it was actually inspired by genuine equivariant homotopy theory. But let me give you a definition which doesn't mention genuine homotopy theory at all. And it's defined as what is called the non-abelian derived functor, derived functor, functor of the functor which take, goes from projective modules over R up to abelian groups. And what does it do? It just takes a projective module P to the abelian group of symmetric bilinear forms. So what is that? That is just HOM over R from P tensor R, P, R, and then you take actual C2 fixed points, right? Somehow the difference and maybe I write down that this is the abelian group, group of symmetric bilinear forms. And the point is that somehow, you see, this is different. When I, when I wrote down this functor that I called copper S before, there I would take homotopy C2 fixed points. And here I take actual fixed points. So this is actually an abelian group it doesn't have negative homotopy groups or stuff like that, right? It's not a, not a non-connective spectrum. And so you take the non-abelian derived functor of that 
That gives you something which one can also express in terms of so-called symmetric powers, non-abelian derived functors of symmetric powers. This has been studied a lot by Dolt and Puppe and Ibuzi and others. Could I, could I ask uh, Nicholas, um, is, uh, uh, Thomas, um, so uh, is this using simplicial modules or co-simplicial modules? No, this is actually, derivation. Uh, one, I mean, it's both actually. It turns uh -huh. out you can, you can it turns yeah. out you can extend that to the whole perfect derived category. So, uh, so you use simplicial co-simplicial or something I mean, like, way, like in the like in LZ. Right. This is actually a very recent observation, I think, done by several people, by I think Saul Glassman, Luc Illusi, also Akil Matthew. Mm -hmm. Somehow mm -hmm. what you can do is like Dolt Puppe style, you first do it for simplicial abelian groups. Yeah. And you get a functor which is defined on the positive derived category. Right. But then the point being that functor that I get is actually, it's quadratic. It's too, I mean, too excisive in the sense of good really. Uh -huh. It turns out actually that there's an equivalence of categories between two excisive functors defined on like the connective part and two excisive functors on the whole derived category. Oh, okay. So this justifies Illusi's right. uh, so trick in fact, uh, and retrospectively. It, and actually prove more, you can prove n excisive functors from the derived category. And actually, I don't even need to say perfect, but I can if I want. From the derived, I mean, let's say perfect so that we don't have to add further conditions, up into any other category, say spectra. This is actually equivalent to functors which are n polynomial on projective R modules up into spectra. And n polynomial here is in the sense of Einberg MacLean. So any any n excisive functor on the derived category of a ring is actually determined by what it does on projective modules. And so the process I described above is just reverse engineering that. You start with a functor defined on projective modules and you extend it to the whole derived category. Right. That is, I guess, what's going on here. And then that's, I mean, you don't have to, I mean, the way if you want to do it in practice is, of course, I mean, to answer your question, you first do it for simplicial abelian groups, which gives you the positive part, and then you extend. I mean, the way you can extend is by just, say, left can extending any random extension, and then you do the n size approximation. Ah. Here, actually, in fact, yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. You see that this actually doesn't change the value. You have to prove this little lemma that if you have an n size functor which vanishes on the connective guys, it's zero. And that you prove by induction over the homogeneous layers. Yeah, anyways. So, okay, so good. So we have this actual like symmetric forms and we can take the non-abelian derived functor. And this is totally different to saying homotopy fixed points, these homotopical version of symmetric forms that I did earlier. And so here you see here really the setup of these like quadratic functors is super essential. And then once you observe that this functor exists, with actually hard work, you can prove the following theorem. This is actually what took us longest in this whole project. So the first part is, I guess, by also in our joint papers, is that now what you can do is you can look at this classical L theory of R. That was the one where I did actually put that constraint about the dimension of the Poincaré objects of the chain complex, where I forced it to have sit in degree minus n to zero. And this is now equivalent to actually just the connective cover of the, I guess, the L theory spectrum, L theory spectrum of that d perf R together with this genuine quadratic functor. And that is actually, this, this statement is actually algebraic surgery. What you do is you start with a sort of Poincaré object for that genuine functor, and then by, by the fact that this genuine functor has certain connectivities, you can actually perform algebraic surgery as long enough to push it into the respective degrees. And this is what actually totally fails if you, if you did homotopy fixed points in, in, in terms of fixed points, because then the, you wouldn't have the necessary uh, connectivities to perform algebraic surgery. Yeah, and then the second part is uh, that, I mean, this was done by Hebestreit and Steimle, motivated by, I guess, work of Galatius and Randall Williams on cobordism categories. 
or like inspired by their method, they prove that the Grotendieck width spectrum of that d perf r with this functor copper g, that is actually equivalent to this group completion Grotendieck width spectrum that I defined at the beginning. Right, that you should think of the uh, version of the Gilles Waldhausen theorem, which tells you that k theory of a the category of projective modules is in fact equivalent to k theory of the category of perfect complexes. Same, same, I mean, somehow this is more complicated here, but somehow it's the same, same line of theorem. Yeah, and I guess from this last theorem, if you now combine everything I've said, you see how to prove the first theorem I had on the board or on the, on the whiteboard. Namely, uh, in this setting, you just apply the abstract fiber sequence for any Poincaré infinity category. This one, I will apply it to the Poincaré infinity category given by this genuine functor here. I mean, maybe I actually never said this, but I should have said that this Q, copper G, maybe this was clear from the context. Ho hopefully, this copper G actually defines the structure of Poincaré infinity category. And then you input these two comparisons, one and two, and then you get the fiber sequence of classical terms. Yes, and that is what I wanted to say. <laughs>